Hey, this is Jesse with Create This. I'm a full stack software engineer with 23 years of experience, and recently I have been using ChatGPT uh, in a pair programming context. So, for those of you who don't know what that means, it basically means ChatGPT is doing all the work, it's doing all the, the programming, and I am telling it what to do, basically. I'm, I'm basically like a, like a micromanager in that situation. So, I'm I'm in the passenger seat and it's driving. And that has been working quite well for me for small projects. Uh, for larger projects, it seems to have difficulty holding large amounts of uh, code in its quote unquote mind, so to speak. Whereas I can hold a project that has millions and millions of lines of code in my mind with you know, very little problem. Uh, ChatGPT, once you get past like a few, a few files, a few thousand you know, lines, something like that, it starts having trouble. It also has trouble with things like switching from one mode to the other. So every time I ask it to write uh, unit tests and increase code coverage, it, it has trouble with stuff like that. Some, sometimes it'll forget what it, what it was working on. It'll forget that it wrote the code that it's unit testing. But I largely think that those are solvable problems. Some of them may be solvable with training. So I've also worked with uh, another AI called Stable Diffusion. Stable Diffusion can be trained with these things called LoRa's. I trained it on 34 of my own images, own photos, and it can now do a pretty good job drawing me in just about any context that I ask it to. So Stable Diffusion is like a text to, to image kind of thing. So I can say, draw Jesse doing jujitsu, something like that and it does a pretty good job. Perhaps in the future, something like the equivalent of a LoRa will be available for ChatGPT, um, and that'll allow us to train it for like larger projects, and then it can work efficiently within those projects. I don't really know. I'm not an expert in this field. I was talking to my 10-year-old daughter the other day, and I was explaining this to her, and I realized that she didn't quite understand what the implications were of this statement that I'm using ChatGPT for pair programming and that it's doing most of the work. So I tried to explain it to her and I'd like to sort of relay that conversation to you as the viewer. First, let's, let's get some context. I am 42 years old for pretty much the entirety of my life. Computers have been, you know, rapidly increasing in complexity, right? So there are two M laws. Uh, they're not really laws, but uh, they're just kind of like sayings or generalizations. One of them is uh, Murphy's Law. So Murphy's Law, most people are familiar with. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong, right? Not really a law, but, you know, we say it anyway. Uh, the other one is Moore's Law. And so Moore's Law states that, like, uh, and I might be, I'm paraphrasing here, I might, I might have this wrong, but it's something like uh, the number of transistors in a given amount of space will double every two years. So Moore's Law has held true the entirety of the time that I've been alive. Um, so there's never been a time when computers didn't go obsolete within a couple of years. Uh, there's never been a time when, you know, you couldn't go out a few years later and buy a computer that was like twice as fast as the one before for, you know, the same amount of money that you got the one before. Well, this is January 2024, right? My, sorry, actually this is February. It's like February 2nd, 2024. Um, and Moore's Law is pretty much dead at this point, right? So I think officially it's expected to end in 2025, but uh, we're already seeing reports that, uh, it's tripping up and it's, it's not really, you know, we're, we're down to like the, the two nanometer process. And uh, my understanding of what that means is that you, you know, can basically design transistors within a two nanometer space or something like that. Whereas a couple of years ago, we were at like the 12 or the 13 nanometer level. So once, once you go smaller than that, my understanding is that you run into like the, uh, the limitations of um, quantum physics and electrons start behaving in odd ways like jumping across boundaries and doing all kinds of weird stuff that makes it impossible to go smaller. Um, so there may be wa ways around that, but I'm not aware of any like really um, promising ones that would allow us to see a continuation of Moore's law in the future. Does that mean that computers will stop getting faster in the next couple of years, probably not. Like there are probably design things that we can do, and little tricks and hacks that we can do to, you know, increase the efficiency or cause the illusion that, uh, you know, Moore's law is still happening. 
but I, I think the whole system is, is winding down. It's operating on inertia at this point. So uh, at some point in the future, um, the cost of a given amount of computing power will start to become the same year after year, whereas in the past, that cost would continually decrease. So that has some implications for AI, right? Currently, like I think I, I started hearing about uh, large language models back in like 2019, something like that, and between 2019 and 2024 now, uh, they have increased pretty substantially in capabilities uh, at a steady rate. As hardware would increase in the amount of complexity that it could run for the given amount of dollars and the given amount of electricity, uh, these large language models would also increase, and as they increase, they, you know, they gained more, more capabilities. They behave more like a human or, or better than a human in certain situations, right? That's fine, but at some point, uh, if, you, if you view that as a graph, right? Like, here's the increase of complexity of computers. That's going to level off with cost, right? And the only way to get a faster computer when that happens will be to build a physically larger computer. So it'll be like we're going back to like the 1960s where, you know, you have like these room-sized computers in order to do a given job, right? Um, that's kind of unheard of right now. Like we use those room-sized computers for like cloud computing and stuff, but at, you know, at some point if it hasn't already started to happen, that'll start to happen. So uh, whereas large language models, uh, maybe we don't have to make them bigger. Maybe we can just optimize them at this point and they can do even better jobs than they do right now with the same amount of hardware. Maybe not, maybe, you know, maybe they, Maybe they haven't topped out yet and they will continue to get bigger for, for a number of years, right? So I don't really know where that's going to happen, but that graph, it's either going to meet or uh, it's not going to meet and the complexity will be up here, right? Here's where things kind of get interesting. And for people who don't think about money very much and time, uh, this may not be like incredibly obvious. So I was explaining this to my daughter. So today uh, I own a 3090. NVIDIA GPU, right? Which is, I bought it a few years ago. I mean, it's not really top end anymore. I think the 4090 is top of the line for gaming, right? Um, and that's a pretty good GPU. And I can run things like Stable Diffusion and Stable 0, 1, 2, 3, and things like that locally on, on that machine. But I can't run something like ChatGPT. So I believe right now, uh, there are some open source models that you can run locally. One of them is like Llama 2, I think. Um, and I believe you need substantially larger um, GPU hardware in order to get that to run quickly. I don't, I don't know exactly what the state of the art is at the moment, but I know that uh, there are things like A6000s and A100s, and I believe like the, the most recent is like an H100. And so I, again, I'm not, I haven't actually worked with an H100, um, but my NVIDIA 3090 might cost like $1,000 today. An H100, I believe, costs about $30,000, right? So substantially higher cost, like 30 times the cost, right? But the NVIDIA 3090 might have only a third the capability of the H100. So the H100 might be three times better. It might be able to run three times larger language models. You can see that the cost of computing power rapidly increases from the consumer level, right? Once you get into these larger language models. So consider what it takes to replicate a human programmer, right? Maybe it's one H100, I don't know. Maybe it's 10 H100s, right? Whatever that is, I don't really know what it is. I'm not sure that anybody knows what it is right now, but I would suspect that somebody knows that works in the field. Um, so I, I heard a rumor that a company that I worked with in the past was buying um, or, or was talking to ChatGPT about the possibility of run, running ChatGPT locally. My assumption is that that's going to happen. As I was doing this pair programming with ChatGPT recently, uh, I ran into rate limits, right? So I would be feeding it information and it would be consuming it and it would be spitting back out code or you know saying I can't figure that out or something, right? But it was doing its job and it was, we were moving forward in the project and then all of a sudden ChatGPT says, nope, you're rate limited. Uh, so this is like at 10 a.m. and ChatGPT is like, well, come back at like 12.30 or something, right? Like 
just wait a couple of hours and then you can continue. I'm a paying customer. I pay, you know, $20, $25 a month, $29 a month, something like that. I don't know exactly how much it is. You might think to yourself, well, that means that ChatGPT won't work as a professional programmer because you can't be rate limited as a professional programmer. That, work, that won't work in a business context, right? But what ChatGPT is actually saying when they rate you, limit you like that is they're saying you're not paying us enough. They're saying we've allocated a certain number of resources for your plan and you're consuming those resources faster than you're paying us for them, right? So at some point in the future, I think, I, I think of that, that $20 a month plan that I'm paying for right now as sort of a trial plan, not a trial plan for me, but a trial plan for them to see how I'm gonna use the model, right? At some point in the near future, they're going to probably come out with plans that cost a certain amount of money that are more capable and will be able to run programmer-like uh, functionality full-time, right? just like it's an employee. So uh, I don't know what that dollar amount will be. Maybe it'll be $300 a month. Maybe it'll be $1,000 a month. I don't know. Also, more than likely, you'll be able to download that language model onto your own hardware in a data center somewhere that you've bought or purchased or built, right? Maybe it's 10 H100s, you know, 5 H100s. I have no idea, right? Something like that. And you'll be able to have programmer-like capabilities full-time from that language model, right? So it's like you've bought a programmer. The question really is not will that happen. The question is how much will it cost, right? So it's possible that computing will continue to increase to the point where running a language model like that is as simple as downloading it onto your phone. In which case, wow, like everybody will have programmer-like capabilities on their phone, right? Uh, it's also possible that it won't quite get to that point and the uh, power of computing per, you know, nanometer or whatever will reach a point such that, uh, you know, you'll only be able to run that on a desktop PC. It'll never reach the cell phone level, right? I don't know. Uh, it's also possible that uh, large language models that are capable of that sort of performance are so complex and computing can't keep up with it that uh, you have to create a room-sized computer or a warehouse-sized computer and that that costs X amount of money to do, right? So let's, let's just theoretically throw out a number. Let's say that it's a million dollars, okay, to, to create a, a human programmer equivalent. So what that looks like in 10 year old terms for my daughter uh, is, you know, she knows that you can buy cars, right? Well, cars cost a lot of money. Maybe they cost, you know, if you buy a used one or something, maybe they cost $10,000. Uh, you know, maybe they cost $20,000. Maybe they cost $50,000, right? It's a lot of money. It's more than like the, the normal person has in their, their savings account or their bank account, especially when you're starting out and you're young. You definitely don't have that kind of money just laying around usually, right? Unless your parents are rich. Most of us don't have rich parents. What do we do? Well, we have these neat financial tools called loans, right? And they allow us to afford these very, very expensive things that allow us to perform our, our jobs and make money. Uh, and those tools, you know, are provided by, by banking services and we pay a certain amount of money per month for that, right? So maybe a $50,000 car, $50, car becomes a $1,000 a month uh, payment, something like that, right? So that we don't have to pay that whole $50,000 up front. Well, I, I think that uh, it's pretty clear that unless the cost of these large language models is astronomically expensive um, to the point where it's cheaper to have a human. So that's, you know, I don't, I don't know where that intersection is, right? But unless that happens, at some point it will definitely make sense for companies to simply buy uh, a, a, a warehouse, a, a very large computer and uh, put a large, large language model on it that's capable of being a software engineer. And that will make more sense than hiring an employee um, for financial reasons, because it'll be cheaper, right? So here's how that math works out, right? Like say, say all of that costs a million dollars, right? 
I don't know how much it'll cost, but let's just assume that it's like a million dollars or something for one, one software engineer. Um, what's the average software engineer salary? Well, you know, the average, I think, in 2023 was like something like $89,000 or something, but it ranges, right? Like 89 is actually kind of low in the US. Um, you know, it's probably somewhere between like 120 and like 350 on the high end, right? Or 400. So most of us are going to be like on the lower end. Um, but let's just say, let's just say it's $100,000 for the sake of argument. So $100,000 goes into a million dollars 10 times. So if you're a business owner and you're looking at hiring a software engineer, uh, you would look at that and you would say, well, I could hire this software engineer um, for 10 years, or I could buy the data center and the large language model, and I could own a software engineer for those 10 years as I'm paying off the loan. And then as long as that data center is still functioning, uh, you know, and obviously those things have operating costs, electricity, maintenance, things like that, right? Like sometimes, sometimes computer hardware goes bad. It gets hit with like a cosmic ray or something and like a chip, de you know, gets destroyed. Maybe there's like a lightning strike nearby and like it fries something, right? Like there's maintenance costs, things happen. So whatever that maintenance cost is, assuming that it's low enough um, for, you know, say, say that data center is going to operate for another 20 years after it's paid off. You now have bought a programmer and you have that programmer operating essentially for, for free, not for free, there would be electricity costs and stuff and maintenance, but you know, for significantly less than a programmer's salary, one would assume, uh, for 20 years, right? So that's like a no-brainer from a business perspective if, if those numbers work. Um, and so I was explaining this to her and I was like, now, you know, the thing is it doesn't just stop with programmers, right? Like any, any sort of job that takes input and gives output, any sort of office job really, uh, would be valid for this. So we're talking accountants, you know, tax people, tax professionals, lawyers, uh, really possibly a large majority of doctors, right? Like you probably don't want a machine like operating on you, but like if you go into a doctor's office, um, if it takes five seconds to get evaluated by a machine, it takes like 30 minutes to get evaluated by a human, I'd take the machine, right? So a large percentage of doctors might get replaced by AIs. Uh, and eventually, you know, there's no reason why they can't have robots that do the operating, but I wouldn't want that personally. Not yet, anyway. Um, you know, all, all of these jobs that uh, have, have a, a lot of internalized knowledge, that have a lot of skill, um, all of those can sort of be replaced by, by AIs. And what happens when the industry moves on, when new technology comes out, when, you know, all of these things, right? Well, instead of having to retrain them, all you do is buy an update. And so you, you download a new uh, large language model file and suddenly like your programmer is you know the latest and greatest interesting stuff right i would argue that software engineering may be dead it may have been in decline in 2019 and very few people realized it and it may have several nails in the coffin here in 2024 um, i think that probably the industry will continue to move forward um, off of momentum, but also off of the need to, you know, have traditional software engineers, uh, you know, writing glue code for a number of years to wire all of this stuff up and integrate it and things like that. But increasingly, as time goes on, we will be replaced more and more by AIs um, to the point where it may not be a valid job path to be a software engineer in pessimistically, as little as two years, and optimistically, as little as, what, 10 or 20, something like that. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know how long that time frame will be, but uh, it could happen scary fast, or it could take decades. That's it. That was the only, that was the only thing I wanted to say. I just thought it was kind of an interesting thought process, and uh, hopefully you found this video interesting and useful. If you did, smash that like button, subscribe. Thanks. Have a good day.